unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Let's lift our hands and just worship Jesus. Somebody open your mouth. There is no holding back today. There is no holding back today. There is no holding back today. There is no holding back in this place. Hallelujah. There is no holding back. Hallelujah. You made my life so beautiful. And as you were, you have met me here on earth. There is nothing greater than thee. That is why I love you forever. You make my life so beautiful. 
that you have to either remove it or they do a root canal. Your mouth has been in serious pain. God is healing you right now. God is touching that place right now. God is filling you with life in that part right now. After we've finished, you will check it. It will be sorted. Praise the Lord. We may take our seats. Thank you, Jesus. Um, U A H eleven eight J. You have blocked someone. Wow, what a message after worship. You have blocked someone. Just go out, please. <laughs> I know you're feeling like ah, but go, please, go. Praise the Lord. There was a time I was singing that song. It was one of those fast, fast days that had just come to Kampala. That song, Abeda Munsozi. I noticed one thing about it. I had an opportunity to be proud and say, How can I sing it? After all, God abides in me. He can't live, He stays. Praise the Lord. But one day I bumped in a certain scripture in the book of 1st John I want to show us. 1st John 4:14. Are we there? Give me KJV. Let me just confirm with my Actually it is 5 Not 4 I'm sorry mm-hmm. I just feel the presence of God in this place I don't know what it is you came with, but I promise you, something must happen today. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> yes. Um. Yes. Where is it? Where is it? Are we there? Yes. I saw that scripture, First John four four. It says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than the one that is in the world. I had not yet understood the meaning, the literal meaning of that word of. I actually thought God is just saying anything like of. But I noticed that word of there is a possessive term. It is a word that carries the place of origin. When the Bible says that you are of God, it means the very makeup that is the makeup of God is what you carry in the inside of you. We were walking at a certain place where we once were not because of the lust of this world. But then, because of the sacrifice of Christ Jesus, we were separated. And now, John writes and says, you are of God. Not you are for God. There is a big difference between someone who is of someone and someone who is for someone. The Bible says, you are of. The very makeup that Christ carries in the inside of him, that God carries in the inside of him, his way of life, his pattern of life, his influence, everything that he carries in the inside of him, it is what you carry. That's why when he looked at you, he said, you are of me. Praise the Lord. Now, I was busy humming that song and I'm saying, and the meaning blew my mind. Praise the Lord. It is not as if Christ can walk out anytime. 
Neither is it. The Bible says that the spirit that we have received in the inside of us abides in us forever. There is no day the spirit of God will leave you. But then just to understand, the Bible says, I believe it is in the book of First John, that if there is one that is born again, then God dwells in the inside of you. If it be that you are born again, God dwells in the inside of you. What does this mean? Hebrews 7, 7 says that the, the greater is blessed by the lesser. Praise the Lord. Now, when God saw us in the helpless estate that we were, He just didn't look and He didn't have anything to do. No. The greater... I don't like this noise. The greater that is the influence of God, God being the greater influence, came in your life and consumed you to totality. He ate you up. That is why the way you are right now, there is nothing that you carry that is of your own. Everything that is about you is of God. Your children are of God. Your thoughts are of God. Everything that you carry in the inside of you is of God. Why? Because the greater force who was God ate up on the lesser who you are then. You don't have a will. Everything that you carry in the inside of you is of God. Such that if God wants to do anything, He says, He wills and does through us. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. You can never be disadvantaged as a child of God. You can never walk and be in the same perils and failures like them that do not know God. Why? Because you are of God. You carry the substance of God. When God looks at you, He does not look at you like the way He looks at the rest. He sees his very own substance. That is why the Bible tells us that he chose us in Christ. When he was choosing, picking all of us, he had to see Christ to choose. He didn't look at you and see your beautiful face and your makeup and the standards and the things that you have attained. Then he chose you. No. He chose you because he saw Christ. Why? Because Christ is of God and you are of God. Hallelujah. I remember there was someone, <laughs> oh God, I don't even know. Okay, <laughs> let me leave that one. Let's go to the book of Hebrews 9.14. Let's just check Hebrews 9.14. Let me, let me leave that. Hebrews 9.14, are we there? Can we go a little, like 13? Yes, yes. Yes, the Bible says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of ashes and of an ephah sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Can you imagine the blood of a goat, of a bull, of sheep could cleanse the flesh, purify it? And when the sacrifices were made and were done, the priests and everyone that had came there left with a satisfaction that we are what? We are clean. Praise the Lord. Verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from, the, from, from dead works to serve the living God? How much more? Praise the Lord. Why that verse? I remember those days, these people had to have sacrifices to bring before God. They had to have God's bulls, what, and these were a typification of Christ that was meant to die. So, what the priest will do, the priest will only look. Those days it was an outward appearance that will approve you in the sight of God. That is why when you read in the book of Leviticus 21, if you had a flat nose over a what, those things, you are not allowed to come and give bread to God. Why? Because you are below the standards. And how could they, serve, how could they tell someone had a flat nose by looking at you? So what the priest did, the priest will look at the animals and look at this one and say, this one has a blemish. Because it has a blemish, it cannot satisfy what God wants to satisfy. Then he looked at the other one and says, no, by my judgment and by my sight, this one is okay. This one can enter the Holy of Holies. The blood can be taken there. Don't forget, the priest was not just offering the, the blood for the community, but he was offering for himself as well. Praise the Lord. The high priest that has sins, that has to first offer for himself, then offer for the community. Now, 
The priest in his judgment could tell that for sure this animal was clean and it was pure. But the Bible tells us that life is in the blood. He couldn't see in the inside of the animal. So it means there was a revelation of the grace of God even then. Because by the sight of the, pro- of the priest, he could see the animal clean and pure to be offered. But maybe it had malaria. Maybe. Maybe it had East Coast fever. Maybe. Maybe. And that blood, it was only God who will tell. Either that blood suffices or not. So how many times did God by His grace look at these people? Number two. Christ now comes and dies. The blood that was of animals could only work in the flesh. Could only go so far. But man was not just suffering in the flesh. There had to be something that had to go way down deeper. That is why Christ comes as a perfect sacrifice. The book of Hebrews 13 tells us that by His blood we have been perfected. We were perfected by His blood. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ not only could... Life is in the blood, yes? Not only could the blood of Jesus Christ take away sins, but the blood of Jesus, since it was life, and Christ says that he was the light, the blood could see every evil thing that had to be sorted in the inside of humanity. The blood went deeper to the things that the blood of a cow, of a goat, of a sheep could not sort to establish that this had to be taken out. This had to be dealt with. This had to be... Now you realize that God actually in those days dealt with these people by His grace. Even by the very own sight of the priest, there was nothing that could suffice in the presence of God. Save that Christ died. And when He died, we were perfected. Once and for all. Sanctified. Once and for all. Because this blood of Christ carried the efficacy that the blood of cows God's sheep and anything could not carry. Praise the Lord. Now, it is presented. This is a priest, Christ himself, who does not present for his sins. Why doesn't he present for his sins? Because he became the substance seen. It was a process of exchange. He became seen that you may become his righteousness. That was impossible if it was going to remain at the flesh level. Someone had to see beyond every human frailty. That's why the Bible says, he saved to the uttermost. Someone had to see beyond what a man carried. And that was the light, and the light was Christ Jesus. And for that, we are who we are today. Praise the Lord. Let's go back. Let's go back to Hebrews 14. Hebrews 9.14. The Bible says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from works, dead works, to serve the living God. The priest had only to affirm that these were dead works operating in a person. The priest in offering for himself and offering for a community had to be because they could not do anything apart from dead works. What was the issue? The issue was the nature. For as much as a man could do good things, they could only do, but there was something else empowering them. It could only go so far. Until when Christ came. Now, I noticed one thing. The purging of our consciences from dead works. The Bible says to serve the living God. It means if I carry a conscience that is full of dead works, doing to get, doing to please, doing for God to get this, doing for God to get this position, doing to... Every time I'm serving in that place, I cannot bring before God. I cannot bring... I cannot serve the living God. It is important to understand... That every time I feel by my human effort, I have to do something to please the living God. Then I'm in dead works. I cannot serve the living God by dead works. I serve the living God when my, my, my conscience is purged. And it is a living conscience. Only living consciences alive unto God can do a service unto a living God. Now, when Christ went in for us, that is what he got for us. 
Because by then it was impossible. The blood of gods and cows could only go so far. It could not bring you to the place where you are today. Dead in Christ, yet alive unto God. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. Now, let's continue. Let me show you another scripture. Let me show you another scripture. Yes, let's go to the book of Ephesians 1, 13, 14. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. Praise the Lord. Don't forget that in Hebrews, every time these people went to offer, their offertory before God was a place of remembrance of sin. They had to remember because the sacrifice that was given could only purge sin in one year. Meaning the next year the priest comes back again. Sin is remembered. The other year the priest comes back again. Sin is remembered. But it is only Christ that went in for us once and for all. If you be in Christ Jesus Christ, no sin is remembered about you. Why? Because the blood of Jesus went and saw everything that had to be covered and covered it for you. Praise the Lord. Now, I remember those days, the Bible says that Levi offered because he was in the loins of who? Of Abraham. But again, this thing brings me back to another moment in God. If Levi offered because he was in the loins of God, remember Christ, the church was in the loins of Christ. So whatever Christ accomplished, he accomplished for the church Forever. We enter in into something that Christ lifted up his spirit and say, this is eternally finished. Nothing can take away your salvation. Nothing can take away what you found in Christ. Why? Because the Bible tells us that we were not as they that were appointed unto wrath. No. We were called to obtain glory. When we enter Christ, we obtain glory. Our lives are full of glory from day to day. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. Let's look at um, Ephesians 1, 13, 14. Oh God, I feel God in this place. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. The Bible says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Praise the Lord. When we trusted God, we just didn't trust God. Our salvation came by the gospel of truth. What is truth? Christ said that I am the light. Everywhere there is light, there is a manifestation of truth. Apocalypse. Praise the Lord. Only Christ could see what man could not see. And by that the gospel came. And when the gospel came, you obtained glory. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This one tells me that everything that you have because Christ died to give you cannot be taken away. Everything that you have because Christ died to 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 have you have, cannot be taken away. If the Bible says that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, far above principalities, powers, and might, you are seated there forever. If the Bible says that you have divine health, you have it forever. If the Bible says that your success is from glory to glory and strength to strength, you have it forever. Nothing can take it away. If the Bible says that you are birthed into a lively hope, you have hope forever. If a person came to you and they said, I do not have hope, they are saying hope was taken away. Now, I noticed one thing. A person that does not carry hope does not carry positive imagination. Why? Because hope is that joyous, confident expectation of eternal salvation. So when a person comes to you and says, Mama, this has happened. I have no hope. They are saying the lively hope unto which they were begotten unto has been taken away. It is impossible. That is why the Bible says that the expectation of the righteous must come to pass. There is nothing that can take away what you receive. Because the Bible says in the book of Hebrews 9.14 that God by the eternal spirit, Jesus by the eternal spirit. Why by the eternal spirit? Because the salvation that was supposed to come upon your life was meant to minister eternal results, eternal influence. 
Everything that is about you and about your life is eternal. Nothing can take it away. Praise the Lord. And I believe, I believe that is what First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 was telling us. That all these things that we have in Christ Jesus Christ, they have been kept. The Bible says, blessed be God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Yes, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and an undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept by the power of God through faith and through salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Praise the Lord. The efficacy of the blood of Jesus is that everything that was obtained because of his death lasts forever. If you obtained life, the Bible says you have everlasting life. If you obtained glory, it can't be separated from you. It is eternal glory. If you obtained hope, the Bible calls it glorious hope. It cannot be taken away. If you got hope again, the Bible says it is the sure hope, which is the word of God. You cannot be separated from the greatness that you carry. Everything that Christ died to give you belongs to you. It is held together for you. Not by your strength, not by your working, not by your power, but by the heavenly, they say, by the heavenly. So, it is the duty of the heavenly to ensure that your purpose is straight. It is not your duty anymore. Why? Because we were, we were appointed to walk in these good works. They were preordained. You just walk in them. You wake up in the morning and you just heal the sick. Not because you prayed a lot. Uh -uh. These are the good works that God preordained you to walk in. You do the things you do not because you have to fast a lot and pray a lot. I'm not saying we don't fast. We fast and we pray as a ministry. But we first must understand that my father said something very important. He says the beginning of freedom and liberty in the spirit is number one, to understand that everything that you have was freely given unto you. Everything. So when I enter the presence of God, I begin to understand that I am number one a king. Why am I a king? A king number one walks in the place of, dem of domain. He has everything. I am number one, the king that has everything before I am a priest to utter anything. Before I utter in the presence of God, I carry the understanding that everything that pertains to life and godliness, I own it. I have it. And with that mind, I enter in my priestly office to start to utter. Why? Because that is how God anointed us. He says that you are priests and you are kings. Number one, you are kings and you are priests unto God. There had to be an order. That you are number one, a king. Why? A king because kings have a domain they rule. Kings have a place they, 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 they oversee. Kings have everything. Have you ever had a king asking for anything? Kings have command. The Bible says that in the word of a king is authority and power. Kings have everything. So by the time they stand in the presence of God, they are not as they that are seeking to see. No, they already saw. They only come to affirm by their power, by the word of their mouth. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. Now, let's go back. Where, where, which scripture did I read? Yes, the Bible says in the book of, let's go to second, no. Let's go to John 9, 5. John 9, 5. Actually, let's go to John 10. Leave John 9, 5 alone. Let's go to John 10. Around um, 27. Around 27. The Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. Uh -huh. And I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 29. My father which gave them to me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. 
You are of God, little children. You are of God, little children. And you have overcome the world. Praise the Lord. We don't walk as they of the world who panic. That, oh God, I'm going to lose this. And, oh God, I'm going to lose that. No, we are held in the palms of God. Not only are we held in the palms of God. Christ has covered us in the palms of God himself. We are securely hid in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now we understand when Jude was talking to those guys, he opened up in Jude 1 and says, to the church that is preserved in Christ. You are preserved in Christ. Your health is preserved in Christ. Your life is preserved in Christ. Your work is preserved in Christ. Your children are preserved in Christ. Fanero is preserved in Christ. That is why we rise higher and higher and higher. Because we don't keep ourselves. We are kept of God. Praise the Lord. And for this, we are not as they, when 10,000 fall at their side, they worry. No, it cannot come near us because the Lord is our habitation. Nothing can come near you. Why? Because you are preserved in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus took you and he put you in the inside of himself. And if you doubted that Christ, maybe he won't stand it. He says, he, you are in him and him in God. You are hidden in Christ and Christ is hidden with you in God. So, if I still doubt and say, oh God, maybe something can happen to Jesus. Uh -uh. He says, you and I are together in God, preserved. By this we know that we shall prosper in this life. By this we know that we must shine in our purposes in this life. Why? Because the keeping is not ours. Something else keeps us. Something else watches over us. Something else preserves us. Something else has filled us. Oh. The Bible says, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. You are dead. No wonder when, when Paul was writing to the Galatians, he said that I no longer live. This life that I am living, this life, this life that I'm living, he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself even being in the flesh, you needed faith. Why? Because you are of God, little children. You are born of God. You are preserved of God. You are kept of God. Everything that surrounds you is God atmosphere. That's why God did not just say, I will walk in them or I will live in them. No. He says, actually someone was helping me define that meaning. I will parambulate in the inside of them. Meaning, I am now a house unto which, not just a building, but it is a place where God takes his comfort and just walks around. When God feels bored, when God feels he wants to relax in the day, he just takes a walk. He parambulates around. He rejoices around. Praise the Lord. That is why your borders are kept. Nothing can stand against you. You don't just wake up in the morning and feel excited. No. If you want to walk, God is excited and he wants to walk. Praise the Lord. You carry the glory of God in the inside of you. My brothers and sisters, don't forget that the Bible tells us that we were called to obtain glory. We have it. We shall not obtain glory when we die. No. We are glorious beings. You have been glorified in Christ Jesus. That is why the Bible says that in Christ you live. In Him you move. And in Him you have your own being. The Bible says, what is it that can separate you from the love of God? What is it? What can separate you from the love of God? The Bible says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God justifieth, uh-huh. 34. 
Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. Who is it? Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercessions for you? What does that mean? It means God gave you Jesus. He can't condemn you. Now, when Jesus came, the only plot now he has for you is to intercede for you. He can't condemn you. My father taught me one thing. You can never condemn a man you intercede for. It is impossible. If you intercede for somebody, you can't, contend, you can't condemn them. You can't wake up with a leap and condemn them. Why? Because your prayers now begin to become the places of the very preservation that preserves you every day. If Christ preserves the church, you preserve the lives of men. That is why your family members are the way they are. Why? Because the anointing of preservation around your life is not only for you. It goes to everyone that is associated, that knows you, that is related to you. Praise the Lord. That is why Lot, Lot could not leave Abraham alone. Why? Because in Abraham was his preservation. He knew if I let this man go, I am without anything. I am without nothing. I will be killed. Now you stand. I now see men and women who nations are going to call. And those nations will not be needing armies. No. They will need you. Because by your very own presence and manifestation in that nation, it will be enough as the armies and 10,000 soldiers of that nation. You are a preservation factor. You preserve everywhere you go. If you step in a place and it is a marriage where a man fights woman, sit there, take a night there. It will stop. Why? Because you preserve marriages. By whatever is in the inside of you, you preserve entities. What is in the inside of you preserves systems. What is in the inside of you preserves every entity of this life that God created. Praise the Lord. That is why, if I were a soldier, if I were a, a doctor, I, I would think twice. Why? Can you imagine being the chief commander, yet you are the preserver? Meaning, I come to an army and I've come to do nothing. Why? Because by my very own appearance to that place, war is ceased. It is ceasefire. Because I'm called to preserve. My life is for preservation purposes. When you hear that there are battles and wrangles in our government, don't run away. Go there, be elected, sit in that parliament. You will preserve our nation. The Bible says that when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. It is our time. We have to enter those places and those systems and sit there and let the preservation of God take over. Praise the Lord. This is the time that God called the church to walk in. A time where heaven is established in the foundations of the earth. The systems of heaven have to be established in this earth. And not by anyone, but by you and me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ah, which scripture are we? Yes, uh, 35. Yes, the Bible says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No, first go to 34 there. You've left something I wanted to see. Yes, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also maketh intercession for us? Uh huh. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Who shall separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us? Every factor that was meant to separate you, Christ by his eternal spirit went and saw it and covered for it and paid for it. And now he looks at you and asks you, who can separate you? Who? Shall tribulation? Shall distress? Shall persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? I wish somebody understood this. 
Because I noticed one thing. When you are in the love of God, you are in the highest place of the manifestation of signs and wonders. If you are perfected in the love of God, you are one that is perfected to cause any change in the surface of the earth. Why? The Bible says, God is love. But don't forget the Bible says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was what? So, hey, don't laugh. <laughs> so, God, number one, created, he looked around Eden and he said, okay, by my own power, I have created everything unto perfection. Everything is how I want it to be. But are you aware if God wanted, he would have lived in that Eden alone and just be walking there and doing everything alone? But because there is a God that burns with love, he created an object. The Bible says in the cool of the day, he came and communed with Adam. God is love. If, he, if by his word, everything came into being, then by love, everything came into being. That is why if you are born of God, you are a normal love seed. You are a normal love child. The Bible says that the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. You naturally love. Why? Because God loved. The Bible says, God, for God so loved the world that he gave. Not for God so burned in wrath and anger. And the Bible says, for God's soul, while you are yet, while you are dead in your sins, God loved. What does that mean? God looked at the fornicator and loved. God looked at the thief and loved. God looked at the murderer and loved. God looked at these prostitutes, whatever you can call them, and loved. Why? Because it is impossible to separate God from love. The Bible says, if you have no love, you don't know God. Don't boast about knowing God. But if it be that the love of God could look at a prostitute and love, because in its mind it's thinking, love is the word. By the word, I can change her into anything. By the word, she's not just a prostitute. She is a prophetess. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The Bible says, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. Now, God creates this beautiful place and puts Adam there. The Bible says in the cool of the day, he used to come and commune with this guy. Relationship purposes. Praise the Lord. And every time I notice when God calls us, he calls us to the, he calls us to the places of love. Intimacy, you can't be intimate with someone you don't love. It is impossible. That is why, if you feel that the salvation you're carrying right now is in a place where you feel forced to pray, forced to go to Fanero, forced to do what he, forced to... No, check how you entered it. Just check how you entered it. Why? Because the, it is love that called you out. It is love that brought you from the depths of hell and made you a king. It is love that picked you from anything that you were then. And made you who you are today. It was love. Love is a place of communion. Koinonia. Praise the Lord. Now, you cannot commune with a different entity from yourself. You cannot fellowship with a different entity from yourself. That's why the Bible busy tells us, do not, do not unequally yoke yourself with non-believers. And non-believers, I was telling some, some people, non-believers is not just, oh, that one is a Muslim, that one is a one. No. If you meet a person, you, you believe that you must raise the dead. And this person believes that there is no raising of the dead. Do not 
can equally yoke yourself. Papa, I'm sorry. I know I have to work on that one. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What is righteousness without life? So if I'm believing in my righteousness, a dead man must come back to life. Why? Because me, myself, I'm an entity of life. And there is someone saying, Mama, you people over preach the grace gospel. A person cannot raise from the dead. Those who are those old days. You may just be relating with an equal yoke. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, I'm sorry. sorry. Praise the Lord. Today I met an interesting man in a taxi. And then he told me, "Um, Nyabo, stop talking about God. Then I said, hey, what's the problem? Then he said, actually this God you people be busy talking about all the time. It is the same God. He comes from a certain religion. He told me, the very God he meets in that religion is the very God we pray in Fanero. Ah, I said, okay. I told him, I have no problem with that. I asked him, there when you go there, 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 in your things there. He said, "Uh uh-huh. Do dead men raise? Do, do, do lame people walk? Do blind eyes see? Do, because me, I see that every time I'm in Fanero. Then he looked at me and I could sense in my heart that we have different gods. Eh? Why? The love of God has not, perfected, has not been perfected in the inside of them. When the love of God is perfected in the inside of you, we enter heights of manifestation of who God is in our generation. That's why we have Fanero. Why? Because we are love seeds. We are love beings. We are out of a God full of love, grace, and mercy. Everywhere we go, we impute love, 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 love. We don't know anything save the love of God. Praise the Lord. That is why it is impossible for you to hate on a brother. It is impossible. You just think you hate them, but you don't. Uh, Try it. It is impossible. You can't. Because you are born of love. Praise the Lord. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2.12. 2 Timothy 2.12. Eh, okay. I don't know why I tend to look in the Bible here also. Um, Yes. 2 Timothy 2.12. I I, I don't think that is why while we suffer. Um, Not while we suffer. At least not that one. First go down. (laughs) Don't laugh. (laughs) I want the scripture which says. um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see. Um, 2 Timothy. 2.13. 2.13. Can we look at it? Maybe it's there. Ah, uh, no. I want the one which says, For I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded. That one is the one that I want. Is it First Timothy? Second Timothy 2 something. Just give me some minute. Please, please. You've seen it? Yes. Second Timothy what? Second Timothy one twelve one. Okay, the Bible says, "For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that He is able to keep that which I committed unto Him again is that day. When we enter salvation, that which we have committed unto God, He keeps until that day." He keeps until that day. When you enter salvation, everything that pertains to your life, God keeps until that day. And guys, God is not Uganda police or what police or your watchman outside or what those people you say, no, I called them and they didn't turn up. No. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded. 
It is a persuasion that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Whatever you committed to God, he kept it. And what happened? When you entered the work of salvation, you committed everything that is about you. And he kept it. He kept it. You are kept by his power. Everything that, 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 that must be upon your life, it is kept. You are called to walk a certain walk in God and you're saying, I don't know how to do it. He said, don't worry. Those are preordained things. I thought about them. I, as God, went before you, lived that life, accomplished all those things for you. And as you come in right now, you come to walk a life of victory. Yeah. Guys, remember, God did not put Adam in Eden when it was still under construction. Adam didn't come when God is still saying, hey, cow, goat, sheep. And he's just calling things and Adam is just bumping in things like, hey, God, so you had not even prepared me fruits. And then God says, fruit, uh, hey, God, so you had not even, you had not put water. And then God says, streams flow. Hey, God, no, no. God in the mind of pre- preordination, he knew. He puts everything in line and everything in order. That when Adam comes, he's coming to a life of relaxing. He knows God gave it all. But guys, how much more the work of salvation? We are living and we are walking in the finished work. Christ finished. He is lifted up and seated in the right hand of God the Father. He finished it all. And when he finished it all, you got born again. You came into a place where there was abundance. You turn this right side, there is abundance flowing. You turn this side, there is just free things. You turn this side. He did it all for you. That is why the Bible says that on his right hand, there are pleasures evermore. But Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Christ becomes that pleasure. Now, our walk of salvation in Christ is a pleasure walk. I came to pleasure, I came to enjoy. The Bible says, at his right hand are pleasures evermore. Pleasures evermore. But that right hand where there are pleasures evermore, Christ is seated in the right hand of God the Father. That is why when you are born again, When you enter this life of regeneration, you enter a place of pleasure, a place of rest, a place of fulfilled purpose. Oh God, how we will carry that mind every day. Because every time a child of God begins to walk in this conscience, you begin to manifest these things. You manifest these things. Every time you carry that conscience that, ah, everything I have. Everything I have. I'm just a pleasure being. I just enjoy this life. But if you notice that you are struggling in salvation, you can't make it. Why? Because some of us were told, the first days of salvation, God is busy pampering you. Mm. Day one, day two, day three, one year. Uh-huh. Now he has, he's not keeping you anymore. He has let you out in the world. Suffer. So you're there struggling. You don't understand things. So you struggle. Guys, that was not the right way that we have learned Christ. That is not how we have so learned Christ. Why? I noticed when I entered God, now things are just, it's pleasure. They can't be love without pleasure. They can't be. The reason as to why I see Fanero guys worship God the way they do. And they just let out their lives. It's because this has become a pleasure. Why? In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And in the right hand, there are pleasures evermore. But you notice, every time you start to feel in your heart sad, and you feel uh, defeated, and you start to feel, um, oh God, I think I'll not make it. Oh God. You have separated yourself from pleasure. Why? Because Christ at the right hand is the pleasures evermore. And Christ is the word. When I separate myself from the understanding of who I am in Christ Jesus, that's when you start to feel, oh God, oh, I'm like how. The doctor says you're sick, you just agree. You have separated yourself from pleasure. 
Praise the Lord. Because I noticed, every time we walk, by the way, we don't just prophesy. Hmm? We don't just prophesy. Why do we prophesy? We prophesy because every time I utter a word, I create a certain imagination. And because you get that imagination and you catch it, you enter that place. You are anointed, you have an anointed mindset. That every time you think of, of something, you enter that place. If I can just meditate, the Bible says you carry the mind of Christ. If I can just think about something, I enter that place. So, the reason why I can come to you and I tell you that that says the Lord, this and this is going to be like this. No, you know already, I'm just sparkling your imagination to make you enter that place. Why? Because your imaginations are anointed. Your imaginations is the place of life. Whatever you imagine, you become. Whatever you meditate upon, you become. The Bible says, for as a man thinketh, so is he. Not so he shall be. So, if I think broke, I'm broke. As a man thinketh, so is he. So if I think I've failed, you've failed. If I think I'll never be married, you will you never. If I think about what? You will never. Why? Because every thought process is meant to take you somewhere. Whatever you imagine, you become. That is why every day when we fellowship in the word of God, when we read, the word of God begins to bat sight in the inside of us. And when we see, we are. We are. I fellowship in the word. I look at it, oh my God, I start to imagine myself. You are. The intent, the reason as to why we have to feed in the word, why we have to commune in the word, it's, why, it's because when we commune, we begin to get impulses. And with those impulses in the inside of us, the ones that Paul called holy emotions, you become something. You become. In my meditations, in my thoughts, I, in my everything, I become that thing. Now, please, leave the devil alone. Let me tell you a story I told some, some people. Another guy in Kenya told me that he was one day walking in the spirit. And then he met the devil, and the devil was walking like this. Like this. And then he asked the devil, devil, chichi. Then the devil said, these Christians, they just like, they just like putting everything on me. Now look at this Christian. Even this thing, he put it upon himself, but he's busy saying fire. Fire to the devil. Devil, I bind you. Why are they binding me? I'm, I'm, I'm innocent. As my father usually says, you are responsible for everything that happens in your life. Everything. Leave the devil alone. The devil knows you. He knows your position. He knows who you are. You align yourself and your mind and your purposes and everything that you are to the king that you are. The devil knows there is a king anointed. And that king that is anointed, he is well wired. The devil is well wired to take commands from that king. If you say devil go, he just goes. If you say whatever, he knows there is a certain wiring of the kingly anointing in every child of God. He knows it. Not even the devil alone, but every creature of God. Every creature of God knows your voice, knows your sound, and knows your position in the spirit, and carries a mind and a willingness to obey to anything you say. Kabaka cannot just enter here and everyone is like this. No. So you will feel it. He cannot just pass down and he's in his jeans walking like this. And everyone is saying, this Kabaka of Uganda, what? You know, you know what happens every time he comes out of his. You know what happens. There's even a time we fought. Because he couldn't be given a right of way. Now, I understand the essence as to why the Bible says, creation groans for the manifestations of the child of God, of the true sons of God. Every time you pass, they're like, mm, but we thought this is our king, but, but, but. They groan. 
Why? They are meant to respond to you. You carry that thing in your, in your mouth. The Bible says that where there is a king, where a king, where a word king, a king's word is, there is authority and power. Ecclesiastes 8, forgive me that scripture. Eh? Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The Bible says, give me an amp. Amp. The Bible says, for the word of a king is authority. Eh? And who can say to him, what are you doing? Who? Who can say to him, what are you doing? He says, for the word of a king is authority, not it carries authority. When you say it carries authority, you separate authority from the entity, the word of the king. The Bible says it is authority itself and it is power. Meaning every time I release the word, it goes to work. Either for your favor or not for your favor. When you say, I am sick, you have released something from the bosom of who you are. When you say, I am the president of Uganda, so be it, you are. When you say, my papa said there are presidents in this place. There are ministers in this place. They are what in this place? And some just look and say, oh, wow. 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 No. No. A certain close friend of mine told me something funny. He told me, Modesta, I was walking in the streets of Kampala. And then I just told myself, oh God, the glory of God has descended upon Kampala. And then I said, hey, why? But I just saw everyone speaking in tongues. And I said, and I was just passing there and I'm saying, this is the thing. This is the thing. Only to listen, to listen closer. And he noticed one thing. They were not speaking tongues. They were busy saying, Sheva Zalukomi. Sheva Zalukomi. Now... Now, for him, he was just saying, glory. Then he told me, oh my God, that place is full of tongues. Only to get closer. Than... Sheva Zalukumi. Sheva Zalukumi. Sheva Zalukumi. Sheva Zalukumi. Sheva Zalukumi. So for him, he thought, those were deep tongues being spoken in the street of him. I tell you, anything you imagine, you create. Praise the Lord. I also had to laugh at that one. Hallelujah. So, because for him he thought and imagined it, let's wait and see. You never know what is going to fill the streets of Kampala. I wonder how another man will pass and hear Sheva Zalukumi, Sheva Zalukumi, Sheva Zalukumi, and another man is hearing Shantalabarawa, Shalabakarabarawa, Shabarakarabarawa, Shalabarakarabarawa. Hey, these are two different people. One is a king with an intention to create, and another one is a simple passerby. Whatever happens, let it happen to she- What did he say? Sheva? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Whatsoever fills the heart of a man produces images. Those images that are produced because of what has filled your heart become your home. They become your dwelling place. I was telling someone of the days when I used to fear. When I would see my cat and go like, I would say, hey, hey, ghostbusters. I feared that thing until one day I literally felt someone came and opened my net and entered it. 
Why? Because it was an epitome of my imagination. And it grew so much that it created that place. So, that that I fill my heart with, that that I fill my senses with, that that I fill my meditations with, produces what must be my home. It produces. When I sit there and I'm like, oh boy, I'm rich. Oh boy, I'm rich. I am the greatest, richest, whatever, whatever. You are creating your home. And not only is it for you, but kings will come to your rising. The Bible says, and he shall give Gentiles to your possession. They will come to your rising. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, let me go back. Um, Hebrews 9.14. Hebrews 9.14. The Bible says, Uh Uh-huh. Oh my God. Just one minute. Something has just dropped in my spirit. Whatever fills your heart creates imaginations, creates those places that finally become your home. Yeah? I noticed one thing. When the priests entered in the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifice, it could only purge the flesh. Nothing could be changed about the heart of a man. That's why Jeremiah looks at it at Jeremiah 17. And he says, wicked and desperate heart. That was the wicked and the desperate heart that man carried. But then Christ comes. Not only does he come to help your wicked and desperate heart and wash it. The Bible says in Ezekiel 36, 26, that he gave you a new heart. Because heart commands nature. Your heart is the way it is because of the nature that you carry in the inside of you. For as much as the priests did everything they did to wash and cleanse people and do ceremonial things of observing animals and observing so and so and observing, they could change nothing about the heart of a man. There had to be a pure sacrifice, one that was morally perfect, spiritually accurate, everything perfect to give you perfection in salvation. And now he comes. He does not just deal with your heart and and, and, and blot the sins like... There's another word. Cover the sins. And do what? Those things. No. There was an implant. You were given a new heart. Not a cleansed old heart. A new heart. Ezekiel 36 says, A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. For I will take away, he took it away, the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Uh huh. 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Now you notice with a new heart came a new home. What was the new home? The home of walking and keeping the statutes of God and the judgments of God and everything that's about God. You don't struggle to do them. The the heart that must do them came. And that is the power of the Holy Ghost in the inside of you. That is why I don't understand how a man lives the whole of his life and dies without the influence of the Holy Spirit. What were you doing on the surface of the earth? Because without this divine influence, you are equated to one that died yet walking. You just. But there's nothing about you. That's why the Bible says that man is vanity. A person that carries vanity in them. They are these people that have not realized that there is this other side of life. Yes, 
It is proper to say that the heart is desperately wicked. And I've had many people pray and they say, my heart is desperately wicked. But it's only proper to you because you don't know the truth. The desperately wicked heart Christ dealt with it. why he had to see he had to see the, all the corners that pertain to a human being all the things that pertain to your life and godliness, he had to see all those places and he noticed all the places were covered but you couldn't change here took it away and said now nah, I give you something that with this thing you rest for the entire of your life why? do you want to do? I will and I do in you Do you want to walk? I walk in you. Do you want to move? I move in you. Do you want to be? I am the being in you. And so you are a God Christ being. What do you want to do with your life? I do it in you. What is it you're thinking you want to be? I am in you. What is it you think you want to go? I went for you. Praise the Lord. That's when I noticed when I was reading Ephesians 1 that even the calling and the choosing of God upon our lives was according to His pleasure. He just didn't choose you. He just didn't look at you and say, "Ah, this one prays the Lord. I like her. Mm, 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 mm. She's an evangelist. No. No. You had to be chosen because Christ went to a certain place for you. And he went there once and for all. You can never do anything to reverse that. Your place and your state of salvation is irreversible. You can't do anything about it. You can't change it. You can't do what over you. No, it is irreversible. It is permanent. You stay like that. Why? Because the issue was the heart. And he said, no, I took it away. I gave you a new one. Now you do everything by pleasure. Not because someone is forcing and pushing and and making you feel like, Oh God, I need to do this. No. It is just an act. Because the heart brings out the actions. The heart brings out everything that you are. No man was anything even when they did good things. You can give up your body, the Bible says, to be burned. But if you don't have love, meaning if you are not born of God, if you don't carry the seed of God in the inside of you, you are nothing. Because you are born of love. Praise the Lord. I like us to stand now. I feel the Spirit tell me to stop here. Somebody just speak in tongues. Somebody just thank God. Somebody thank Jesus that He went in for us. My God, you are working in us. Great is your grace in the inside of us. Great is the working of your power in the inside of us. My God, you are strengthening somebody today, oh God. According to your glorious power, you are strengthening that sister, that brother. You're Your preservation is in Christ. Sickness cannot touch your body. You are preserved. 
Weakness cannot be your portion. You are preserved. Come on, somebody, she said, I feel the Spirit of God in this place. You preserve lives. 
up your hand. Say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive you today as my Lord, as my Lord and Savior. I am born again. I am a child of God in Jesus' name. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. 
For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at funerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.funero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Venero. Venero, make manifest. Thank you.